Hello everybody, Mike here at Game From Scratch. Today we're going to be taking a quick look at Orcs, a 2.5D open source game framework. Uh, it's very interesting in that it actually takes a data-driven approach to organizing your games. You'll see exactly what that means in a second. Now this is more of an introduction to type post. We're not going to go into a huge amount of depth for this. Another thing I want you to keep in mind with this video is I actually just put and purchased a new microphone. That overpriced, complete garbage Razer Siren I was using up till now, I just I, I give up on it. The, the random hisses, cracks, and pops were just driving me nuts. The fact it picked up so much background noise drove me nuts. So I finally went out and grabbed a different mic. What a waste of money, but hopefully you guys do enjoy the sound of this new mic better. Do let me know if you do get any audio artifacts, if the volume isn't good enough, if you're hearing a lot of background noise, that kind of stuff. I think I have it calibrated right, but I will be interested to know what you guys think. So let me know in the comments down below what you did think of the audio quality. All right, so without further ado, let's jump right into Orcs now. Um, Orcs, as I mentioned, open source law, um, game engine. It's available at orcs-project.org. I will obviously throw that link down below. It's released under the Zlib license. Um, Zlib is one of the more permissive of the open source licenses. You can basically uh, do what you want. Um, you basically do not have to give them any money. I don't even think you have to give them any notification. You do um, absolve them of rights, that kind of stuff, standard to most open source licenses. Uh, currently runs on Windows. Uh, using either Mingw or uh, Visual Studio for building uh, Linux, Mac OS, iPod, iPhone, um, and Android. So the big platforms are all supported. Uh, it's very modular in the way it's set up. There's functionality um, for most of the things you would expect to do in Game Engine. There is no level editor, but there is um, importers for popular level in, um, creators such as the Tiled Level Editor. Um, you see here your, your typical set of functionality. It's um, it's actually in 3D space, so if you wanted to create a 3D render on top of this, you could. Uh, renders using OpenGL and OpenGL ES2 on mobile platforms. Um, it's got most of the support you'd expect for uh, sprites, text, sound, um, and then again, it's very data-driven. Plus, you've got a couple other features down here like a clock system, anima animation chaining, custom animation events, visual effects, uh, that kind of stuff. Pretty much, it's got the functionality you would expect from a typical... 2.5D engine. Uh, there is also a very good amount of help available. There are a solid set of tutorials and there is a good um, set of reference materials available here as well. It's all linked off the Orcs project again, so I won't bother relinking that. And Orcs itself is hosted on GitHub. Now they haven't done a binary release in a while. So you see here, the last release was January 28th, 2017, which is a little bit discouraging. But if we go in here and actually go to the actual GitHub page, you'll see there was development commits last week. So uh, we're gonna build this guy from scratch using code. But don't worry, it's a very simple process assuming you've set up your build chain at this point. So assuming you have GitHub installed, let's go to the directory where you are going to go ahead and build this guy at here, let me just jack up the font a little bit here. Uh, so, uh, properties, font, 24 points should work. All right, so hopefully you can see that well enough. And we need to go back to this page, of course, and grab the git link. Let's copy that to our buffer. And then now that we're here, we do a git clone and then paste that link. And this downloads everything we need to go ahead and get started with this guy. Uh, now, I'm using Visual Studio 2017 for this particular example. You can use any version of Visual Studio you want or the Mingw uh, tool chain. Unless, of course, you're on Linux and obviously um, you're on your own in the build process, but you probably already know how to do it. So this created, in fact, a directory called orcs. We're just going to switch into that. And before we get started, we need to run init. So this is a batch file that is in the root directory. Um, oh, no, setup. Sorry, my bad. So what this does is basically downloads uh, the dependencies that we need before we can get started building. Um, this takes, I don't know, I think this only takes a handful of seconds, so I'm going to pause it anyways. Okay, so that ran through, created all the various different projects for us using the resources it just brought in. So if we look at our directory now, um, you'll see we have a couple of key ones. First off, there's uh, tutorials, and the other one is, uh, I believe, code that we want. So we're going to switch into code. Like so, and you'll see there's a build folder. So we're gonna switch into build. And then what we want is obviously whichever platform we are making it for. So I'm gonna go into the Windows directory right here and I'm using Visual Studio 2017. So that's the directory I'll go into. There's gonna be a solution file here, uh, specifically orcs.sln. Let's go ahead and open that up in Visual Studio like so. And now obviously you're gonna pick uh, the build that you want. We're gonna go with debug. Now debug is obviously going to be slower than normal. 
um, but it gives you additional information. So uh, solution, right click, and let's do a build. The default should be Win32 and debug up here. All right, so let's do a build of the solution. Now this is just gonna basically go through and compile all of Oryx. As you can see, 99.9% .9 of the source code for Oryx is straight C. Uh, some of the plugins are done in C++, but for the most part, this is a C library. Um, it's pretty straightforward too. The, uh, the compilation takes um, less than a minute, I think. Yeah, we're already done. So that is Oryx now compiled, and we're gonna to wanna to grab the output from this. Really, we just want the DLL it just generated, uh, which here, let me just explore. Oops, dot, explore current directory. All right, so go to build, oh, code, bin, and the end result of that build that we really want is that um, DLL. We might want this any file as well, but we'll just go ahead and copy those so that they're available for us in a second. And I'm just gonna go back to our orcs folder, and what we wanna do now is build our tutorials. So go into the tutorial folder, like so, Go into the build directory, like so. And then once again, Windows, and then Visual Studio version that you're using. So I'm gonna go with 2017. And then there's a solution file in here, I believe it's called tutorials. Yeah, tutorial. Just open that up. And once again, select the solution. And we're basically just gonna build all of the examples in this actual solution. And that is basically setting up and getting ready to go. Um, you would emulate this structure and its linker setups for making your own game. Uh, it's fairly straightforward, um, and it's beyond what I want to get into today. So if you don't know C++, uh, include in linker setup, that is a whole different subject. Um, but what we want to do now is going back over here. So remember we copied the, the file, the bin generated DLLs out of here. We just go back into the orcs folder and our tutorials. There's a bin directory, and that's where all of that code that we just wrote was um, created to. Just paste in that DLL and any file that we just created, and that should be all that's required. So now let's take a look at actually how an orcs program is structured, and this is where the engine really shows its uniqueness. So let's go to the very first example here for just creating an object, and open that up. And I'm just gonna go ahead and strip out all of the comments. So you can see just how minimalist this actually is. All right, that should more or less do it. So let's get rid of this bottom window so you can see this better. Here is a Orcs project. And as I mentioned earlier on, it's a very data-driven game engine. So that means what they've done is they've separated a lot of the, the, um, the logic from the engine out from being, instead of being code or object-driven, it's data-driven in an any file that goes along with it. So we're gonna look at that any file in a second. So what you can see here, um, obviously the pound include to bring the orcs header in. Uh, this is the init initialization function, uh, the run function, and exit function. Those are different lifestyle stages of your program. And really all you can see is when you start your game up, you call orcs execute and you pass in those three different functions for the, you know, what to do to start, what to do to run. So this is basically your main game loop right here. And then what to do at exit. Now your exit is, well, empty. Um, so orcs will clean up after itself. You're pretty much good to go. So let's go look at your initialization here. So it's creating a viewport. Um, this is where you do your setup, create your camera, all that stuff. But in this case, it's actually doing it from an any file. And then it creates your objects in your world. And again, it's just creating an object from the any file. So this is the data-driven approach that they've taken. Uh, and then return on success. And then your run code basically just is, um, have we got a quit command? If we haven't, uh, we'll update and then fail, return results. So pretty straightforward, um, not much going on here. And then you'll see there's another um, main here, that's because Windows main has a, a different entry point on a, on a Windows application than it does on a console application. So these two functions basically do the same thing. And that is how straightforward an actual project is. So let's head on back over here to our bin folder. And you'll notice we've got object that we just created there. And then for object, there's an any file. And that's the important part. So here, let's run object first. And you'll see that's all it does. So basically it's drawing a sprite centered to the screen. But um, the code you saw, it did very, very little in code. Well, here is where the logic of your game actually exists. 
Here, let me bring that up in an editor that you can read better. So here is our any file that is driving our program, and this is where the data-driven approach to uh, orcs comes in. So you see here, uh, we have an object called display. Now, so it looks for this attribute, and then these are the properties of it. So here's an object called resource, input, main input, etc. So that was the quick key. So that was what we tested for. Um, in this line of code right here, input is active quit. Well, there's the quit. That's the wiring up there. Now we go back up here, and you'll notice our code from creation. We said, so we're going to create our viewport using the object viewport. So here it is driven in data. So we create a viewport, and all viewport has is a camera. So you see these other settings that you can play with. These are commented out, so they're not affecting anything. But if you wanted to change all those properties, they can be done right here in data. Now, the advantage of doing it in data is twofold. Now, first off, it takes it out of the link build cycle. So you don't have to recompile your code to change things. You can literally just update an any file, and everything is driven by that. The other advantage is it makes writing tools very, very simple. So you, if you're, and also kind of makes validating your game very simple, because if all of your stuff is in external data files, you can just basically write out to them, create simple, quick tools for, you know, creating or configuring viewports, cameras, adding sprites, world editors. Uh, so for example, the importers from Tiled actually are just scripting any files that, um, you know, have the world data in it. So that's kind of the advantage. The disadvantage is you lose IntelliSense, you lose type validation and all that kind of stuff. So when a bug occurs out in your data, it's harder to track. So that's kind of the trade-off for the data-driven approach. So anyways, back to our data. So here we said, all right, create com from compig, we want a viewport. And you'll see here, a viewport simply has a camera object in it. So we're saying the viewport's camera equals camera. Then you'll notice down here we have an entry for camera. So the camera has a width of 800, a uh, height of 600, and the near and far, um, it's positioned at negative 1z in the world. So that's just being set here. So that is how you link those two things together. And that was it. So let's go on back. So that's creating your viewport all from data, just using a single line of code and about seven lines of data. So again, you can change this on the fly without having to recompile your code. Now at this point in time, our code is so small that really doesn't matter. But as it gets bigger, the data-driven approach definitely has some advantages. Um, and then next up, you'll see we create the object in our game. Now remember, there was that character sprite drawn centered in the screen. Well, let's look at how that's configured in the any file. So that is creating object you'll see object has a single value here called graphic and you see we can change other things here we could give a tint uh, we could change the transparency we could flip it along the y or z axis using this command etc so you see there are a number of properties available for objects in the world that can be all configured but the only one we're really setting here is the graphic so now let's go down and find graphic graphic here is a texture there's the file name of said texture and then the pivot point is set to its center now you see all of these other values there now the problem again is when you pull this stuff out of code you lose support for tooling like intellisets etc so looking up all of these different properties making sure that they're spelled right that you didn't make a typo etc becomes a bit more onerous so there is a definite double-edged sword to going the data-driven approach unless of course you do create tools to do the authoring for you and again that's a strike. So this really is a trade-off based environment. But as you can see, you can very simply create um, a new creature in the world. So let's go on back, make a, make a small quick change. So um, for our viewport, let's set the background color to whatever they defined here. So we're just gonna change that out in data. So I'm not recompiling the code, I'm literally just running it. And there you see we now have a new background color. So no change, no need to recompile, and that's the nice thing about being data driven. Going back here, we can change, you know, basically any value we want. So we could say um, we could change out the uh, width or height of our screen. Let's do that quickly. Uh, let's go here. Let's change the camera to 320, 240. Save that. We run our example. And there you notice a much smaller uh, drawing resolution immediately there, no recompilation required. So there kind of in a nutshell is how the setup works. And I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail on it because well, it's a pretty, you know, at this point in time, you have to learn the engine. If, if what you saw here looks interesting to you, I do recommend you to jump into their learning materials. Um, head on back to their website for a second. You'll see 
uh, they have a good amount available here in the learning. So there is a beginner's guide. The beginner's guide basically walks you through uh, creating a game step by step by step, adding effects, events, etc. So handling collision events, you'll see you get into the code for doing it, and you'll also get into the um, the data side of things, the any file for creating the different pieces that all work together. And it's a 20 parter that keeps going on. But on top of that, they've also got a set of tutorials available, which is why I'm not going to go into a whole lot more detail because you'll see there are tutorials for doing uh, just about everything you'd want. And then we come on down here. One I do want to highlight, for example, is they have ones for bringing in maps from other tools, such as I mentioned earlier on tiled. And the cool thing here again is you'd run tiled, you create your map. And then you run it through this converter that basically takes a tiled file and turns it into an orcs file. But you'll notice it turns the orcs file into just straight out more data that looks just like what we've been dealing with in the past. So um, that's kind of starting to show some of the power of the data driven approach. It makes all of your data um, very consistent in where it's located. It makes things like creating this this converter quite simple to do. Um, yeah, so that's about the detail level I'm going to go into. Do let me know if this is an engine that you're interested in seeing a lot more of. I know there's not a lot of material out there for orcs, and I haven't jumped into it with a great amount myself. I played around, created a simple gamer, that, and that's about it. And the experience, the work experience, is very different from a lot of game engines. And if I was a tool maker, if I loved creating tools, this would uh, be a great engine for me to work around. But if you want a bunch of tools, this is probably a pretty poor engine for the most part. Um, so yeah, that, that is Oryx, an open source, portable, lightweight, plug-in based, data driven, and extremely used 2D oriented game engine. And you know what? I kind of got to agree with that description. It's a cool engine. Um, it's got, if we go back over here very quickly, you'll notice the samples are pretty solid. There's a, there's a pretty good number of things being taught. Now, once again, you're going to find a lot of logic is off in the data file. So do be sure to go to that data directory to look up the any file that goes with each example. But you can see most of what you want to do to create a 2D game is in there in the examples or available in the tutorials or wiki. Uh, and it has a good solid um, reference API available. So it is definitely a beginner friendly engine if you can wrap your head around the data's first approach. Uh, so let me know, what did you think? What do you think of the Orcs engine? Is this something you're interested in seeing more of? Or is the, the material they provide more than enough to get you started? Or does the data-driven approach look like hell on earth to you? I'm interested in hearing what you think. It's a very unique engine in its approach to things. And um, you know that's why I decided to share it. It's definitely cool. I love to see uh, open source options out there thrive. Um, this one is a little smaller in community, but it's nice to see that it's still under active development. So maybe a little bit more exposure is a good thing for them. It's a cool project. I recommend you check it out if this looked interesting to you. Also, please, again, do let me know down below what you thought of the sound quality of this um, uh, this video. I don't have a lot of control over the environmental sounds in my uh, area, so I can't use a condenser mic setup. So I do have to use a dynamic mic, but I think I found one and a bunch of settings that actually works quite well to me. But uh, let me know what you think of it. I won't know until I upload this to YouTube how good it sounds on my end as well. So hopefully it was loud enough. There's no background noise and all that. But please do let me know in the comments down below. All right, that's it for now. I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.